I, I, I'm learning some things about gates. Gates are either restrictive or they're an avenue for freedom. Gate, the same gate can be a, a restrictive gate or a gate to freedom, to release you. Gary, when you shut the gate on your road, the specific idea and the purpose behind that is to keep your cows in. <laughs> Linda? Zip it. Zip it. Tammy, would you go over and sit with her, please, and keep her in line? <laughs> you know, that's probably, that's part of it. Sometimes they don't work. But God, I believe there are, I believe there are, there are some spiritual gates that the Lord has uh, established in our lives. And so this morning, I, I want to talk to you about that very thing. Some, it's, gates are very common. I've, I've built lots of gates. I've hung a lot of gates. I've tore down a lot of gates. Hello. She's sitting right over there. <laughs> I know it. You'd think he'd help me out a little bit. Mm -hmm. Well, glory. So I want to talk about these gates. Gates have become, gates can be very common and, 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 uh, but they can also, we, we're also going to look at an uncommon aspect of these gates. And I want to look at how gates affect our lives. You might not have came here this morning even thinking gates was spiritual at all. Get your concordance out at home if you have one. And just type in the word gate. Or, 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 or thumb through, I, I said type in because I have a, a, a concordance on my computer. And you cannot imagine the amount of times that gate is used in the scripture. And if gate isn't enough, put an S on the end of it. And it becomes gates. And the, the scripture is overrun with, with scripture on gates. Gates can be barriers or avenues of freedom. A gate can be a barrier against your freedom, or an open gate can be a barrier to your freedom. Father, this morning, as we look into your word, as we begin to look at this, uh, this topic of, of gates, Father, I pray, God, that you'd anoint this preacher to, to preach your word, to, to more than preach your word, to just literally be your mouthpiece in this house this morning. God, that your anointing would, would be upon me, that it would destroy everything that would be a bondage or a gate, a, a restriction in my life. God, I offer it up to you right now, and I say, God, wash me out, cleanse me, Lord, by your spirit, your anointing. Destroy every yoke, everything that would hold me back. I release it to you right now. I pray that same anointing over every person in this house, that the anointing of God would set on your people today and break off every care, every worry, every concern, everything, God, that would stop your people from hearing from you, from receiving, God, your message today. Lord, and I pray not one person would leave this house the same way that we came in, but that we would be changed by the power of your Holy Spirit. And I give you praise and glory for it in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. amen and amen. Gates can be barriers or they can be avenues. In Matthew chapter 16 and verse 18, just real quick, it says, And I also say to you that you are Peter. Peter, Jesus is with the disciples and he's on the north end of the Sea of Galilee. I've stood in this very spot and, and I've seen the rock. I, I know where they're talking about. And, and I, I get this visual 
picture in my mind of what was happening right then. And, 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 and Jesus looked at Peter. And he said, Peter, on this rock, I'm going to build my church. And the gates of hell or Hades shall not prevail against it. He, he makes this declaration, I say to you that you are Peter. It was Simon. Now it's Peter. And he says, you are Peter. And on this rock, Peter is, where, is, is, is the word Petros. And Petros is a fragment of Petra. Amen? Petros, Petros is a fragment of Petra. The word Hades there is talking about the power of death, that it can prevent the, ad, the advance of the kingdom. And Jesus is declaring to Peter. And as I remember standing there, Tammy and I were, were on the no, at the north end of the Sea of Galilee, and we didn't know at the time, but having been all around that region and gone up on the hill at where there was literally this, these shrines and these temples that were referred to, there, there's a huge big hole in the ground, a great giant hole hole and I walked up actually and I looked in the hole because the hole is referred to as the gates of hell and I, I remember looking in that hole and you can't see the bottom of it it's dark black and it goes way down and in the days of the Bible they ha literally had sacrifices and they threw babies in that hole and they threw virgins in that hole and, and, and it was the gates of hell and, and, and I, I pictured that in my mind and I can remember standing there and, and when as I read these scriptures and I, I see Jesus standing there and he's talking to Peter and he says Peter Peter, you the gates of hell. Are, I'm going to build my church in the gates of, and I can see him pointing up on the hill to where that place is. That that place of death and destruction will not prevail against my church. If we are to look at gates metaphorically, the gate at the entrance of the of the way leads to life. And it can lead to destruction. Look at it this way. We are forgiven, or we are rather given freedom, but our freedom is not without boundaries. We are given freedom, but our freedom is not without boundaries. When you put your cattle in a field, they are free to go anywhere that they want to go as long as they're in that pasture. As long as they stay behind the restriction of the gate, their needs will be met in that pasture. Do you, are you following me? Look at it this way. Adam and Eve were placed in the garden. And there were gates at the garden. And Jesus, or God said to Adam and Eve, of everything in this garden you can eat. You have freedom to eat anything in this garden. Except that. Leave that one alone. Freedom to move about the garden. Freedom to walk around in the, in, the, in, the, in the beauty of the Garden of Eden. Freedom to fellowship with the God of creation. But leave that alone. We're given freedom, but our freedom is not without boundaries. Frankly... We're free to do about most anything we want, except what the Bible talks about. Abstain from these things. Stay away from this stuff. You can do, you, you have freedom and liberty, except for don't do things that are going to bring shame or dishonor to God. We think that's such a big deal, a big a, a problem. It's not a problem if we just would follow Jesus. Herod arrested Peter during the, the Passover celebration. It was strategic. 
It wasn't just by happenstance that he did it. It was a strategic move. They were, it, was, it, was, it was during the Passover celebration, and people were coming and gathering into the area because of the Passover celebration. And, the, and there were Jews in the city, way more than usual, and, and Herod, a typical politician, wanted to impress the people. How many of you know when Jesus and the disciples showed up, they started raising havoc with the status quo, with the way things have always been? How many of you know we just like it the way it's always been? Don't go fussing with this and that and the other thing. We just like it like it is. And they had their gigs, they had their situations, their their rituals, they had all this stuff, and Jesus came in and messed the whole thing up. They're looking for a conquering king, and he came as a servant. Listen, if you're wanting somebody to help you kick somebody's hind end, you're not looking for a servant. At least I'm not. I mean, unless he's going to whack them with a broom or something, you know. They were looking for somebody that was going to, I mean, there's a new sheriff in town. Things are going to be different, Mike, from here on out. Yeah, because Jesus is here. He's God's son. Well, that really upset them when they found that out. They did everything they could to shut them up. Herod's plan was undoubtedly to execute Peter, but the believers were praying for Peter's safety. He had just killed James. And Peter, Peter was the next to be executed. On Friday night, listen, men, I want to encourage you to get back to the men's group on Friday night. We had nine of us there, and, and, and it was good. It was really good. And I want to encourage you, put it down, tell your wife, whatever you have to do, but be here on, on Friday nights at 6.30. We need to come together as men. But we had a great discussion about the battles that we as men are facing. Men that are secure and strong in their walk with the Lord. But why do I still have these battles? Sin still lives in me. What can I do? And we begin to talk about how can we overcome those kinds of things? What is it that we can do? And we begin to understand, we begin begin to realize that there's something different about the church today. And I don't, I'm not, I'm, listen, I'm not trying to say the good old days. But having said that, let me say this. There is an element that is missing in the church today that they had back then. And it was called prayer. It was called, listen, nothing is more important than me getting before God and seeking God with my whole heart. Peter is in jail. He is facing execution. They're going to kill him graveyard dead. I mean, they are going to kill him. They do not want that loud. How many of you know Peter's a loud mouth? And they wanted to shut him up. I'm going to get to the scripture in a little bit. And, and some of this will start to make sense to you. But Herod was going to execute him. But there was some believers, folks. There were some believers. There was a church. There was a family of believers that were praying for Peter's safety. How many of you understand today that a man, and when I say man, I'm talking man or woman. It's non-gender specific in the scripture. When a man is in the center of the will of God, he is immortal. Think about that. When you are in the center of God's will, you are immortal. Let me ask you this. How many wonder this question, just like your pastor does, how come it is that James had to die and Peter got to live? 
How come sometimes your loved ones, you've been praying, seeking God, praying that they would be healed and set free. How come is it that they die and somebody else lives on? Because it was their time. That you, you have, I mean, we've got to come to that understanding. It was their time. The earnest prayer of the church significantly affected the outcome of the events. Prayer changes things, so we need to pray often, and we need to pray with confidence, folks. We need to pray like never before. We talked about miracles that were happening. We talked about people that that moved in the power of the Holy Spirit. We talked about an event that happened right here in this very city. Actually, it was Tri-City. Back in the in the in the old days, we're it, we're we're in our 60s now it can be the old days. When a piano player was sitting at the piano playing the pl- the piano and the Holy Spirit was moving in a miraculous way in that place and the power of God hit the piano player, the piano player tipped over backwards off the piano chair, but the piano kept playing. And it was not a plug-in player piano. It just kept playing. That's the Holy Ghost. Listen, church. I like the way Kathy plays, but I'd like to hear that. (laughs) I'd like to hear what the Holy Ghost has to do over here. I think that'd be pretty good. Church, if you don't know much, and there's a lot of new faces, and I'm grateful that you've decided to be a part of us this morning, and and so I'm grateful for that, and I'm, I'm a little boisterous and a little wild, and I understand that, but just bear with me. I I want, my heart is to see this city turned upside down for the glory of God. I'm not a theologian. Never have been, never claim to be, never will be. But I can preach Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I can tell your loved ones how to get saved. I can lead them to the throne of Jesus Christ. And we can see them get baptized and filled with the Holy Ghost. If you'll bring them to church, we'll get them saved. I'm telling you, that burns inside of me. But it starts with prayer it's got to start in the house of God with people that have that same vision that same passion by the way you want to know what the vision of this church is I'll tell you in a word it's salvation of this city I was really hoping for more right there come on Linda give it to us listen Jesus did not say, go and make theologians. He said, go into all the world and make disciples, starting where you are, moving out from there, unto the uttermost parts of the world. That's what he said. He hadn't changed it. He's not revised the Bible. Man's revised the Bible until you can read it and not feel any guilt about anything you do. But God never changed. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Prayer changes things. So we need to be praying often. We need to be praying with confidence. We, listen, we need a prayer room, folks. We need a prayer room. We need a place where you can come into this place before, before service. I remember the, there was a prayer room in the Assembly of God Church on Division Street. And Sister Willadine would get in there. And Sister Boyles would get in there. And Brother Palmquist would get in there. And, and Sister Hadley and some of those would get in there. And Sister Anderson and, and, and Brother Anderson. and the re, I mean, there was a bunch of people that would go in. And you couldn't hardly stand up in that place. You open the door and just, bam, it just hit you. Because they were praying there was something about the prayer of those old ladies and those old men something about knowing how to get a hold of the horns of the altar and not turning loose until God did something on their behalf church we got to get back to that we got to get back to that my desire is for this house to be to be restored to a new testament church I I don't want it to be a weird thing when the Holy Ghost shows up. 
I want it to be real weird if he doesn't show up. Because here's what I'm talking about. When he doesn't show up, every one of us hit our knees and begin to cry out, Oh God, what has happened? What have we done? What did we do? What did we not do? How can we get your presence back in this place? We do not want Ichabod written across the door. The glory of the Lord has departed. I want to see the glory of God move in this place by power and authority. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. I want the reputation of this church to go out through the community and through the county when people say hey I got somebody that's got cancer well come go with me to the church because I know a place where people can pray and will believe and God will do something in your life God will set you free in Jesus name that's what I want I got news for you that's what Jesus wants he died for that folks He hung on the cross. He bore the stripes for your healing and mine. Listen, if your loved one gets cancer, or your loved one gets emphysema, or your loved one has COPD, or ABC, or DEF, or whatever else is out there, I don't really care. You say, oh, I know a place where we can get you some help. And we go to the house of God because we know a place where some people are prayed up, where people are not afraid of disease. People are not afraid of the devil. And we're going to have victory. We're going to see the battle won for the glory of God that's all I want I don't think I'm asking too much glory to God the phrase but prayer is the turning point in the whole story church never underestimate the power of a praying church never underestimate the power of a praying church When this church begins to learn how to pray, and nothing becomes more important than praying and seeking the face of God, listen, I won't have to wonder about what to pray about. I won't have to worry. I won't have to. The fact of the matter is, I might not have to uh, preach as much. Never underestimate the power of a praying church. There's an old Puritan preacher named Thomas Watson. And he said, the angel fetched Peter out of prison but it was prayer that fetched the angel it was the prayers of the people that fetched the angel turn with me this morning Acts chapter 12 When you're there, stand with me. In honor of the Lord, we stand as His Word is read. If you cannot physically stand, don't worry about it. God knows that. But if you can, I want to encourage you. Acts chapter 12 Starting in verse 1, now about that time, Herod the king stretched out his hand to harass some from the church. Then he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And because he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded forth to seize Peter also. Now it was during the days of unleavened bread, so when he had arrested him, he put him in prison, and he delivered him to to the four squads of soldiers to keep him, intending to bring him before the people after Passover. Peter was therefore kept in prison, but constant prayer was offered up to God for him by the church. And when Herod was about to bring him out, that night Peter was sleeping, bound with two... Isn't it odd that Peter was sleeping? (laughs) 
<laughs> I'm going to get to that in a minute. I just wanted you to be thinking. Um, oh, yeah, verse 6. <laughs> and, when, and when Herod was about to bring him out that night, Peter was sleeping bound with two chains between two soldiers and the guards before the doors were keeping the prison now behold an angel of the Lord stood by him and a light shone in the prison and he struck Peter on the side and raised him up saying arise quickly and his chains fell off his hands and the angel said to him gird yourself and tie on your sandals and so he did and he said to him put on your garments and follow me and so he went out and followed him, and he did not know that what was done by the angel was real, but though thought, rather, he was seeing a vision. And when they were past the first and the second guard post, which, by the way, are gates, when they passed through the first and the second guard post, they came to the iron gate that leads to the city, which opened to them of its own accord, and they went out, and went down one street, and immediately the angel departed from him. And when Peter had come to himself, he said, Now I know for certain that the Lord has sent his, sent his angel, and he has delivered me from the hand of Herod, and from all the expectation of the Jewish people. So when he had considered this, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark, where they were gathered together praying. And as Peter knocked at the door, of the gate a girl named Rhoda came to answer and when she recognized Peter's voice because of her gladness she did not open the gate but ran in and announced that Peter stood before the gate Father God I ask you this morning again to anoint the message anoint me give me unction this morning Lord by your Holy Spirit let your people be moved and changed from where we are today to where you want us to be and I'll give you the praise and the glory in Jesus name and everybody said amen and amen you may be seated listen I got a question for you if you're chained between two Roman soldiers and you're facing the possibility of death being executed the next day, how soundly could you sleep? I'm thinking, I don't know. I don't, I... Maybe a little of this going on, you know, ringing my head, flopping and... Peter's dead out asleep. He, he is out. The angel has to whack him to wake him up. Peter is out, man. In fact, Again, he, the, the angel had to hit him to wake him up. Peter was well guarded by four squads of four soldiers each. Two squads would have guarded Peter for eight hours a day. And then they would rotate and they would change. Luke stresses this detail to set the scene for the mighty power of God. No one was going to escape under that kind of guard. Nobody's going anywhere. He is there. The, the, the guards are as much a prisoner as Peter is because they're behind locked doors. They are behind bars. They are, they are, they are. Mm. No one could escape under human power alone. And Peter knew that. James is already dead. The, the thought of of your, your comrade, your, your fellow laborer in the Lord has just been executed. You're facing that probably in the morning. And he's out like a light. From a human perspective, from a human perspective, the situation appears terribly grim. But from a heavenly perspective, It's just another opportunity 
to display the infinite power of God. Let that sink in this morning. Some of you are facing some things. God has power to to display on your behalf. I want for you and I to be thinking about the gates that may be in your own life. What are the gates in our lives that are holding us captive? What are the gates that are, uh, 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 and, and what are the gates that are doorways to our deliverance? Hello. When God puts a gate in front of you to restrict you, don't tunnel under it. Don't tunnel under it. It's there for a reason. Well, it's so restrictive. It's for your own protection. Mommy, I want to go out and play in the street. Your little boy. Mama, I want to go out and play in the street. No, you're not going out and playing in the street. Well, you're just a mean mama. Right, George? She don't ever let you go out and play in the street. I'm sorry. (laughs) I'm pretending like I am. (laughs) But why? Is it because she don't want you to have any fun? Is it because you don't want your little boy to have any fun? No, it's because mamas are smart enough to know. Dad would probably be saying, yeah, go ahead. (laughs) Go on out there. If you hear a car coming, you know. Not mama, you ain't even going out there. Because there's dangers involved in that. And God isn't just trying to restrict us just because he doesn't want us to go and do anything. He's given us all kinds of freedoms and liberalities as long as we stay within the parameters that he has set. See, perspective is everything. Perspective is everything. How you see the thing is what matters. You can look at the the limitations of God through the perspective of He is just so mean. Doesn't want me to have any fun. I really want to eat from the fruit of that tree. It just looks so good. And so we disregard what God has said, hands off, and we walk over there and all of a sudden things begin to happen. You open gates. Listen, when we watch things on television or watch things on the computer or, 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 or see things on your telephone hello hello is this working hello we are opening gates in the spiritual realm and allowing things to come in that once the gate is open we have a very hard time shutting the gate the rule is this it's just better to leave the daggum gate shut How many of you have opened gates right now? Just be honest before me and God and everybody in this place. Open gates and you wish to God you had some way you could shut the gate and everything that came through it would go back out. Oh, Lord Jesus. Man, George. But it's too late. You already opened the gate. We used to sing a little song. Be careful, little eyes, what you see. Be careful, little eyes, what you see. For the Lord up above is looking down in love. So be careful, little eyes, what you see. Be careful, little ears, what you hear. It's way more than just a cute little song way more than just a cute little song folks it's god crying out to his people listen it's not that i don't love you it's because i do love you that i want to restrict these anything you want to do here knock yourself out as long as you stay in these parameters don't get outside where there are dangers and and all kinds of there's there's booger mans in the dark
I'm convinced, folks, that sometimes we act as if we don't have any problems. Did... I'll try it again. I am convinced that sometimes we act as if we have no problems. And church, the devil rejoices over that. The devil rejoices over that. You want to know why? Because he knows that we don't know that we even have a problem. Search my heart, oh God. Make it ever new. Change my heart, oh God. Help me be like you. You are the potter. I am the clay. Listen, the clay does not ask God to not do this or that. You know why? Because it's a lump of dirt. And he's the potter. Got a news flash for you. You're a dirt. You're dirt. I can prove it. I'm not just being ugly. I can prove it. God dug around the dirt, played around a little bit. Bam. Bam. Made man. The difference is he breathed into him. This, this same type of jailbreak happened to the apostles before, back in chapter 5 and verses 19 through 24. But there's way more detail given here and from his sleep Peter is aroused by the angel of the Lord and he's told to get up the command was accompanied by his chains falling off of his wrist and that there, there's the importance and the significance of the term falling off comes from the Greek word meaning to drop away the chains dropped away Remember the literal definition of rejoicing? It's to spin around violently. If you're chained up, you're only going to go about that far. About fell over. One chain was tighter than the other one right there. Did you see that? <laughs> How many of you need your chains to drop away? God, let them fall off. Neither the angel or Peter touched the chains. They came off because God was setting Peter free. And to begin with, many believers were praying for him in Acts chapter 12 and verse, and verse 12. And they kept it up day and night for a week and, and it helped to bring Peter peace. Prayer has a way of reminding us, folks, of the promises in God's Word. The promises of God's Word. Listen, if God said it, I believe it and that settles it. I don't care what anybody else thinks about it. If I know God said it, I'm going for it. I'm doing it. I'm going to make it happen under the anointing of God one way or the other. That's just all there is to it folks prayer has a way of reminding us listen prayer is not now I lay me down to sleep listen prayer can get ugly probably this the biggest mistake as a as a pastor and as a parent that I've ever made in my life was in Coos Bay Oregon and my oldest daughter had studied and and really fell in love with the ministry of Catherine Kuhlman and she began to pray and she began to seek God and she the, the Spirit of God fell on her and the anointing of God was on her and she would instead of watching TV at night she'd go in her bedroom which was right across the hall from my bedroom and she would begin to pray and cry out and I was working in the woods and I was having to run, be on the job sometimes at 4 o'clock in the morning or 3.30 in the morning and so I'd have to go to bed you know like at 11 
I mean, I was going to bed as early as I could get home and get to bed, and, and, then, and, and then Kayla would show up. And she would be in her bedroom just crying out to God. And I'm not talking quietly. I mean, she would get lost in the Spirit of God, and she would cry out. God had an anointing on her life. And she knew how to get a hold of the horns of the altar. And she would begin to cry out and she would be get loud. And I'm over in the next room trying my best to sleep or stay asleep. And one night, when I was particularly tired, I went in her bedroom and I said, Listen, Dad needs to get some sleep. I need you to just quiet down. That's the stupidest thing I ever did in my whole life. Because something changed that night. Something, it was like I squelched her anointing. I've regretted it my whole life ever since that night. Prayer has a way of reminding us of the promises of the Word of God. The main cause for Peter's peace was the knowledge that Herod could not kill him. Peter's laid, laying there in a jail cell, chained between these prison guards, and he's out like a light. He's zonked. I asked you earlier, it was a trick question. How in the world could Peter sleep? Could you sleep like that? You want to know why Peter could sleep like that? Because he remembered that the Lord had already told him how he was going out. And it wasn't Herod. You know how Peter knew that? Because he had a relationship with Jesus Christ. He knew him intimately. He spent time with him every day. He spent time with him. He knew what, that Herod wasn't going to kill him. Jesus, in John chapter 21, verse 18 and 19, Jesus promised Peter that he would live to be an old man and that at the end of his life he would be crucified on a Roman cross. He simply laid a hold of that promise and committed the entire situation situation to the Lord and God gave him peace and God let him sleep like a baby he didn't know how he didn't know when God was going to deliver him but he knew deliverance was coming the angel brought light and liberty into this prison cell but the guards had no idea what was even going on isn't that amazing? I think that's amazing. I, these Bible stories, are, they, they get me excited. Woo! <laughs> the angel commanded Peter to bind his garment with his girdle and then put on his sandals. These were certainly ordinary tasks to do in the middle of a miracle. By the way, Peter, make sure you put your clothes on. Hello. Put some shoes on. You're going to probably have to run. I'm sorry. See, God often joins the miraculous with the ordinary. And when that happens, we get extra ordinary. Extra ordinary. He joins the miraculous with the ordinary just to encourage us to keep things in balance. Let me tell you something. Jesus multiplied the loaves and the fishes, but he commanded the disciples to go out and pick up the fragments. Amen? Amen? He raised Jairus' daughter from the dead. But he told her parents to feed her. Give her something to eat. See, even in miracles, God is practical. Right? God's practical. 
God alone can do the extraordinary, but you and I as His people must do the ordinary. Are you hearing me this morning? Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead in John chapter 11 and verse 30, 43 and 44. He raised him from the dead, but he said to the men to roll the stone away from the wall. Jesus called Lazarus out of the tomb. Lazarus, come forth. And I'm not going to do my hopping thing this morning. I know it's a disappointment, but <laughs> Sharon. <laughs> Are you ready? This is just for you, Sharon. That's, listen folks, it looks stupid, and you love it when I do that, but that's literally how Lazarus came out of the tomb. Because Jesus called Lazarus out, but he told the men to unwrap him, take off his grave clothes. Listen, he was wound up like a burrito in there. The same angel that removed the chains from Peter's hands could have put his shoes on him. But he told Peter to do it. God, <clears throat> God does not waste miracles. God does not waste miracles. Peter had to stoop before he could walk. It was a good lesson in humility and in obedience. There's a pattern to, to prayer of prayer. The church-wide prayer is what del uh, delivered Peter. I want to show you three things this morning. Number one, the whole church was praying. Have you got any idea? Have you got even an inkling of what God would do if we all prayed? And I'm not talking about, Lord, thank you for this day. I'm grateful that you woke me up this morning. And, and so watch over me and my family today as we go about our bed. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about laying out before the Lord, every one of us, and praying, God, move by your spirit. God, set Myrtle Creek, Oregon, free by the power of your Holy Spirit. Lord, let the deliverance of your Holy Spirit begin to sweep across. And I mean crying out and bawling and squalling and snot flying and all that kind of stuff. It happens when people are praying like that. I've seen it. The whole church was praying. The church, number two, the church was doing all that it could. They were praying specifically for Peter's deliverance. See, that's the thing. When, the, when, the, when the, there's a, a sacred assembly comes together and the church comes together to pray over a thing, that ought to be the thing that we're praying about. I'm praying about my lost cat or even my cows that got out, Gary. No, we've come together like what happened here, to corporately pray and move the hand of God. To seek heaven with purity of heart and with, with conviction of the Holy Spirit that God, it, listen, if you don't move, I'm not leaving here. We, we've lost a little of that, Mike, don't you think? Because, I mean, we've got to beat somebody to... The Hot Rod Cafe. We're so concerned about our time that we don't give him his time. Well, he should. The church was, was praying specifically for Peter's deliverance. Listen, the words without ceasing, without ceasing, it means fervently and earnestly continuing in prayer. The Bible says that we are to, to pray without ceasing, does it not? I believe in 1 Thessalonians. Pray without ceasing. This is what it means. 
fervently and earnestly continuing in prayer. The idea is intense prayer, prayer that captivates and focuses a person's con uh, constant concentration. You ever wonder sometimes? I, I do, and so I, I'm not. I, I won't, let, let me retract that first statement and not ask it about you. Let me just tell you about me. I sometimes, when I pray, I get distracted. Remember, Brother Thomas preached and when we was in the old building over there, and he preached about distractions. How many of you know that the, the devil can distract us? Very. How many of you know that you and I can distract our own selves thinking about these things and those things and the other things? And when we become distracted, we become ineffective. Because distraction does not fall in the faithful, fervent prayer of a righteous man. It does not, it's not in that list. As a church, we need to come together. If we really want to see the hand of God move in our city, then church, corporately, we got to be on the same page. Why in the world did the disciples have the move of God? I mean, the very first sermon Peter ever preached, 3,000 people got saved. Oh, Jesus. I'd like that. What's the population of Myrtle Creek? Pardon me? 3,500. I only need 500 more and the whole city gets saved. There might be 500 people attending church this morning in Myrtle Creek, so if I preach and 3,000 get saved, we're still pretty close. Why? Because they were all gathered together in one mind, in one accord, in one room, seeking the presence of God, praying and beseeching God. Oh, God! Bam! What are you going to do when your neighbor catches on fire sitting right beside you? Don't blow it out. Man, it. <laughs> the idea is intense prayer, prayer that captivates, prayer that focuses every person's concentration. And the root word, the root meaning of the word it means to stretch out. And the picture is that of a church that was stretched out, prostrate before God, earnestly and, and fervently crying out to him for his sovereign deliverance of Peter. Lord, sovereign, I mean, lay flat out. Sucking up carpet and bugs and whatever's in it. God, we need a move of your Holy Spirit. My neighbor's going to go to hell if God doesn't do something. Does that, does that stir anybody? When's the last time you thought about your neighbor going to hell? God might be waiting for you to go over there. Hey, I have got the greatest new, I mean, Publishers Clearinghouse comes to your door. Swing that puppy open. Where's my check? Oh, I, I got something way better for you, Jake, than a check. I've got the deed to a mansion in glory. Let me just tell you about my Jesus. Let me tell you what God did for this old sinner boy. Listen, I'm not here to sell you nothing. I'm not here to sell you a thing. I just want you to know about my best friend in the whole wide world. His name is Jesus, and he set me free. He set me free. And he sent me over here just to tell you about him because you know what he told me? He told me he wants to set you free. Hello. I'm just trying to get you wound up a little bit. The church could do nothing and they knew it. Peter's only hope was God. Peter's only hope was God. Acts chapter 12, verse 9 and 10. So they went out and followed him. 
So he went out and followed him, and he did not know that what was done by the angel was real, but thought, but thought, thought he was seeing a vision. And when they were past the first and the second gate po- guard post, they came to the iron gate that leads to the city, which opened to them of its own accord. And they went out and went down the street, and immediately the angel departed from him. They passed through two gates Two guard posts or gates. They arrived at the iron gate, which led to the street. It was a gate of deliverance. It had turned from, transition had happened in that gate. It was a a gate of resistance. It was a gate of restriction. But when God got involved, it swung open and it became a gate of deliverance for Peter. See, with dramatic effect, the gate just mysteriously and miraculously opened up. The angel stayed with Peter just a little bit longer and then left Peter alone. And I want you to see that the same gates that were meant to restrict Peter were also the avenues of freedom for him. I've been on several military bases in my life, I'm not, a, I'm not a, a military person, but my son is. And you, you just don't drive on one of those. I mean, it, you, there's some gates you got to go through. And I'm talking about restriction. <laughs> you try and crash the gates doing 98 and them truckers won't be rolling, they'll shoot you. The angel stayed. The, 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 um, the gates that were meant to restrict were, were avenues of freedom. The prayers of the group of believers were answered as they prayed. But when the, when the answer arrived, listen, when the answer arrived at the door, which was a gate, they didn't believe it. They did not believe it. She didn't even open the gate and let him in. Can you imagine that? That gate in that moment was still acting as a restriction in the life of Peter. It wasn't until they came and opened the gate that the restriction was removed and he was able to go in and join his family and friends in in the house. We ought to be enough people of faith that believe that God answers prayer, the prayers of those who seek His will. And when we pray, we need to believe that we're going to get the answer. Pray, faith, believing. And when the answer comes, <laughs> church, how many of you prayed for something and got the answer to your prayer and you're like woo and it was like wow awesome that's great because sometimes we didn't think it was going to happen and when it does we're like wow that's so awesome we ought to be thank we ought to be thank from the last time the word leaves your lips we need to begin to thank god for the answer that is on the way For the answer that is on the way. When the answer comes, let's not be surprised. Let's be thankful that God has answered us. That God is moving in our place. That God's hearing the prayers of of His people. Amen? Bow your heads with me. Let me ask you this question this morning. Are there any gates in your life that are restricting you? Specifically, the gate of salvation? Have you asked God to open for you the way of salvation?
Bible talks about another gate or door. And he says this, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And if anybody asks me to come in, if anybody will open the gate, open the door, and ask me to come in, I will come in and I will have fellowship with him. I will sup with him. I will spend time with him. He's talking about salvation. He's talking about knocking on the door of your heart. Let me tell you something, folks. God's not going to kick the door in and say, listen, I'm coming in your house because I'm going to talk to you. No, he won't do it. He stands at the door and he knocks and he, he, he wants to come in. But he ain't coming in unless you ask him in. Today, maybe you're here today and you've never opened the door to Jesus. Maybe you've never asked God to come into your heart and change your life. The Bible says that we must be born again. If we want to see the kingdom of God, if we want to spend eternity in the kingdom of heaven, I say, I say it like that because we're all going to live eternally someplace and when there's only two choices Joshua said in chapter 24 choose you this day whom you're going to serve as for me and my house we're going to serve the Lord so the choice is ours folks and we have to ask God come into my heart create in me a clean heart Renew a right spirit in me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. Cast me not away from thy presence. Folks, it's going to be a sad day when Jesus has to turn people away. But he's a just God. He's given us every opportunity to receive his son and the finished work of the cross of Calvary and I stand as his messenger this morning and I bid you I beg you I plead with you if you have not accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior would you please do it this very morning time is short time is short God is calling his people he's calling you and I to, to walk with him. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed, people are praying today. You may be watching by way of the internet and you feel like you need to get saved, but when I ask you to raise your hand, I can't see that you're raising your hand, but if you'll pray, God will set you free. I promise you that. You don't have to be in church to get saved. And so with no further ado, if you're in this place this morning, you'd say, Preacher, I've never accepted Jesus as my personal Lord and Savior. But today, you recognize the hand of God on your life. He's ministering to you. and He's, he's, he's wanting to do something in your life. Listen, don't be afraid of that. He's a good God. He's a loving God. He's a caring God. He's a compassionate God. And He wants to set you free. You might very well be the, the, the start of absolute revival in Myrtle Creek, Oregon. If you're here today and you say, Preacher, you need to pray for me. I need Jesus. I want you to raise your hand. Yes, sir. Lord, I need Jesus in my life. I'm asking the Lord to come into my heart to set up His throne on my heart. If, if you're here today and that's you, you're saying, Lord, help me. I, 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 I want you to raise your hand. Don't be afraid. We'll, we'll love you in this place. Maybe you've already accepted the Lord at some point in your life, and today you're, you're here in God's Spirit. 
has brought conviction into your heart and you're saying, you know what? I, I don't know how it happened. I don't know exactly what took place, but I recognize this morning that I, I, I'm not in a, in, 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 in a close covenant relationship with Jesus like I know he wants me to be. And so this morning, I, I, I feel like I've drifted far away from God, but today I, I'm coming back into the safe harbor of, of the love of God. And today I'm going to ask the Lord to re re-establish my life in him if that's you today I want you to raise your hand anybody at all say preacher that's me I want to recommit my life to Jesus right now anybody at all preacher that's me listen if you raised your hand for anything I want you to come to this altar I want to pray with you right now I, I want you to pray right now I want to pray right now Thank you, Father God. 